Hi, I'm Tim, and I'm here to talk about modeling a protein. So here in the CBM, we've been creating these student modeling programs now for many years, and yet we still find that someone who is new to these programs are often a little bit confused as to what it actually means to model a protein. So I want to talk just briefly about um, how we think of modeling a protein. Uh, I have here a physical model of a protein. This is known as a zinc finger. So we're going to use this as an example for this explanation. So when we talk about modeling a protein, what we specifically mean is you're going to design in a computer environment an image of a protein. And whatever that image is in a computer environment, you'll be able to export a file that will be recognized by a 3D printer and you can then create this physical model of the protein. That's what we mean by modeling a protein. An important point I want to make is that you don't model a protein just because you want to have this cool structure on your desk. You model a protein because you want to tell the story of the protein. You want to communicate something about this protein. You want to talk about what this protein does uh, and why it's important. Okay, the example we're going to use here is a zinc finger. And I'm holding here in front of me a uh, simple model of a zinc finger. The reason we use this as an example is it's a small protein domain, sometimes call this a protein motif. It consists only of about 30 amino acids. And starting here at the end terminal end, you have a two-stranded beta sheet uh, and then a little little loop here and a short alpha helix. So it has some beta sheet, it has an alpha helix, and this so-called protein fold is stabilized by this green zinc atom, which is simultaneously bound by two cysteine residues from the beta sheets and two histidine residues uh, from the alpha helix. So that is a zinc finger. There are lots of zinc finger proteins encoded by the human genome. One of the things we learned from the Human Genome Project is that one of the largest families of proteins in the human genome uh, are, are these zinc finger proteins. What do they do? Largely, usually, they're DNA binding proteins. And as they bind to DNA, they somehow regulate the expression of that, of that DNA, of the gene that's just downstream from that binding site. If this zinc finger motif binds to DNA, and if that's the story we want to tell, then this model, <coughs> it's a smaller scale model, but this might be a more effective model. Because what you see here is not just one zinc finger. <coughs> We've modeled one, two, three zinc fingers that are just linked together end to end to make a zinc finger protein. And these three zinc fingers are binding to a double-stranded fragment of DNA. So these are sequence-specific DNA binding proteins. Every finger, every zinc finger, can bind to three specific base pairs of double-stranded DNA. So here we have a three-fingered protein known as ZIF-268, and it's recognizing a nine base pair segment of double-stranded DNA. Okay, so these are, these are two dramatically different models. They look very different, even though they're different representations of the same thing. So let's back up even one step further and talk for a minute about how are you going to go about designing this model. So you're going to start by going to the protein data bank, and you're going to download a file which contains the XYZ coordinates for every atom that's in this structure. So if you open a PDB file in JMOL and you read all of those atoms into that computer environment and you display each atom with a small sphere, in this case even color-coded according to the identity of the atom, so you get uh, what we call a space-filled model of the protein. Now, rarely do we create a physical model of a space-filled protein because in my view, they're not really very useful. You just get this lumpy thing that is way too complex to really derive much information from it. 
But the point is, any image that you can create in the JMOL environment on a computer, you can actually convert that into a physical model using 3D printing technology. So what you do then, designing this model, is largely a, a series of decisions in which you decide what not to show. You're going to simplify this and only show those features of the protein which tell a story. Here's a version that I, I really like. Um, because this is an alpha carbon backbone model that I was using before. But now you can see at every one of these elbows, every one of these alpha carbons, we've now displayed the structure of the side chains, amino acid side chains, that come off of each one of these alpha carbons. We've also included the zinc atom with the two, cysti two cysteines and the two histidines that bind to this zinc atom. So this is the kind of model that would tell a story about the structure of this protein. And we could simplify it even more than by going back to this model that you've seen before. All right, and this might be what you want to end up with. But now, let me show you just a few more models. Depending upon the story you're trying to tell, you might want to emphasize that a zinc finger protein is usually made up of multiple copies of this zinc finger motif. So here's a model that you might want to make in which there are three zinc fingers that are joined together. So we still have the, the zinc atom here. We have the two, hist two histidine, two cysteine residues that bind it. And notice this arc of amino acid side chains right here. So this, these are the side chains from three consecutive fingers that bind to DNA. If my arm is double-stranded DNA, this three-fingered protein is going to bind right here. So this might be a very useful model if you really wanted to talk about how this zinc finger protein binds to, to DNA. Okay, and then I can show you this model at a smaller scale. Here's the same three-fingered protein, but now we also included in this model the DNA. So we have a blue double-stranded DNA fragment here with the three fingers bound to it. So this is another very useful model if you wanted to talk about the DNA binding properties of a zinc finger protein. And finally, the very last story I could suggest to you is that people are now beginning to take these structures of proteins that nature designed for us and we're learning how to engineer those proteins to do something that nature had never intended. So here I'm holding what we call a zinc finger nuclease bound to a very long piece of DNA. This is probably 20, 30 nucleotides of DNA. And these nuclease domains then are going to cut this DNA. And this is an engineered protein with which we can then begin to edit the human genome. So, I won't tell you anything more about that, that story in this short video, but this is an example of the kinds of stories that you could then begin to tell with a series of models of a zinc finger, from something as simple as just a single finger in which you can talk about the, the structure of that finger, to a model that you could use to tell a story of an engineered protein. So I've shown you a whole series of different models of a zinc finger protein here. And I guess the point I'd like to make then is that they're all the product of a design. They're all different because the person who designed them had a different purpose in mind for how they would be used. So your, your job as the designer of a protein model is to decide, first of all, what is the story you're trying to tell with your model? And then you incorporate and display in that model only those features of the protein that will be useful in conveying that story to someone who you're talking to. So good luck with your modeling program.